Hey there, welcome to Broadcast to Post. I'm Jeff Sengpil, CTO at Keycode Media. This is the show where we interview leaders and experts in the AV, broadcast, and post-production spaces. We're giving you the inside tips to grow your media workflows and business today. Hello, I'm Jeff Sengpil, Chief Technologist here at Keycode Media. In this segment, we're going to discuss finding career tech ed grant dollars for media spend. Dr. Lee Whitmore with the Focus Right Group in Education will be joining us shortly. His team has developed a killer white paper and presentation that has helped many educators figure out where to find grant dollars and, most importantly, how to submit a winning proposal. We're then going to drop in on an interview between former instructional designers and media instructors Matt Stroop and Doug Dahl, discussing their 20-plus years of success writing grant proposals for Glendale Unified School District's Clark Magnet High School. And then Jonathan Amayo, our Chief Education Officer here at Keycode, will join the full panel to discuss how to design curriculum around grant-approved projects. So as always, our quick infomercial. If you got any questions about how to design AV, broadcast, or post-production systems for your education facility, don't hesitate to contact us here at keycodemedia.com. We've got an experienced team helping design RFPs, installing AV and media systems, not to mention supporting thousands of customers across the country, including projects like TV studios, media centers, podcast studios, lecture halls, conference rooms, and full campus-wide unified communication systems. Thanks, Jeff, for having me here today. It's great to be here again. I'm Dr. Lee Whitmore with Focus Right Group in Education. What a pleasure to have time with all of you today to talk, to talk about something very, very important, which is how to find career tech and resources and funding to support your program in vocational education, in um, career pathways for music, audio, media, video. Uh, just a little bit of background on Focus Right Group in Education as we've changed dramatically over the past 18 months to two years. Focus Right Group is Focus Right and Focus Right Pro, Novation, Amplify Music. We're also Atom Audio, Martin Audio, Optimal Audio, and Sequential, the iconic synthesizer brand. And in our work with Key Code Media and in education solutions, we work across all of those brands to provide the best quality, best opportunity for your students and training and skills to make things happen with audio, in music, with video for career and technical education. Just to give you a little idea of where Focus Right Group and Education Solutions um, are found in the professional space and on campuses, uh, places like Belmont University in Tennessee, Full Sail University in Florida, the Orange County Public Schools. Um, you may know many of these professional uh, uh, applications and customers as well, including we will have Focus Right RedNet as a part of the background supporting the upcoming Super Bowl um, broadcast uh, in the next month. Today, I'm happy to share with all of you an amazing expert guide on how to locate and find career and technical education program funding. Authored by a third-party expert in conjunction uh, with me and the team at Focus Right Group, We've put together a number of resources um, on how to um, find funding for career and technical education, what makes a successful grant program, and where to apply. You know, with CTE funding, and that's connected to federal funds that essentially maintain year over year more than $1.2 billion in Perkins 5 funding uh, from the federal government. Uh, and where do you find information about that? Simply go to cte.ed.gov. Um, depending on the state that you're in, and we provide links and access to support for this, every state's CTE funding goals are established each year with the Department of Education. You want to take a look at those um, goals that are established by your state. This expert guide will help you find those and target your grant proposals so that in fact they are in alignment with the CTE career pathways that are established for your school district and for your perhaps community college program. So in the guide, what do we talk about? Where to find funding, as I just mentioned, and then also what's important in your proposal. We've talked to a dozen experts about 
the success that they had in creating proposals for career tech ed funding. They've secured millions and millions of dollars in this work. And then also, why to apply? You know, one of the things that you may want to consider right now is there is significant support for diversity, equity, and inclusion in career and technical education. Uh, there, in fact, is a wonderful program that's being launched by the Department of Ed, an online webinar and live event coming up this February. In the guide and then in Focus Right Group resources online, we have a number of case studies. These case studies will help you, in fact, target uh, a successful uh, career tech ed proposal for funding. I'll give you three quick examples. The first, Rancho Bernardo High School, uh, Poway Unified School District in Southern California, works with Key Code Media on a regular basis. Another is a career pathways program in music at Lawndale High School in Centinella Valley in the LA metro area. And a third wonderful case study, and we'll provide with key code access to links on um, video resources supporting the Fort Hayes Metropolitan Education Center. An amazing program for music and audio that's graduating um, all three of these, dozens and dozens of students directly into careers in media and also into college careers that take them from there either. Um, another thing I'd like to mention just briefly is skills related to career and technical education. Key Code Media and Focusrite um, provide um, audio over IP and Dante certification programs in RedNet. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to, pro to provide training around and certification for your students and your faculty in your programs. Something to consider at pro.focusrate.com forward slash certification. And I'll also mention that, again, contact Ecode Media. They can share with you the Career Tech Ed Expert Guide that I'm talking about today. Go to pro.focusrate.com forward slash CTE dash EDU dash roundup for lots of video case studies and PDF case studies as well. And don't forget that certification programs to support career and technical education for your students, whether they're going on to career, um, careers directly or through community college or university programs. The skills that they receive in online training like that in our RedNet certification will do well by them as they move into some of their first jobs coming out of school. So it's been a pleasure to be here today. I can't wait to have the conversation with our wonderful panelists today. And again, Jeff, thanks and to Kiko for having me here today. Hello, I'm Matt Straub from the Key Code Education Department. In this segment, we're going to discuss grant funding success from two people that successfully led their high school to be named one of the 30 most successful high schools in the United States. Today, I am joined by a retired Senior Director of Instructional Services and Principal at Glendale Unified School District's Clark Magnet High School, Mr. Doug Dahl. Over many years, Doug successfully received technical grants from big names like NASA, Disney, Boeing, Cisco, CTE, and Perkins, to name a few. The list of student accomplishments using the tools purchased from these fundings was huge, including using underwater robots and GIS software to help Ventura County's search and rescue. There was also funding that was used in collaboration with JPL and NASA on a robotics hardware design, for the NASA JPL Mars 2020 Perseverance spacecraft, pretty wild stuff. It's worth noting that before I joined Key Code Education, I worked with Doug as a media teacher at Clark Magnet High School, and together we helped win millions of dollars for grants that helped to completely revamp our video production lab media center, including a new multi-camera studio space, control room, and professional production and post-production workflow that rivals the major studios in nearby Hollywood. And it is an absolute pleasure to reconnect with my friend and colleague for this discussion. So for those of you online, thank you for joining us. So Doug, how you doing? I'm doing good, Matt. Nice to see you. You're looking well in Pennsylvania. Thank you. And you're looking good in uh, Texas as well. So let's, uh, let's dig into some questions and uh, take a trip down memory lane. So uh, what was accomplished, in your opinion, what was accomplished with some of the media and other departments using grant funding? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, we used we use it for a multitude of uh, items. First of all, is kind of seed money for programs that were in our strategic plan and what we wanted to accomplish over the years at the school was 
was uh, in operation, it's still in operation, but when I was operating it, um, the, uh, one of the things that, that we did was we trained, we trained teachers. We, uh, we used the, the, the money for, for planning and collaboration. Uh, there was an awful lot of kind of buy-in because the school was, the school was new. It was, it was a former middle school that was converted to a, to a high tech high school. And we, uh, we wanted to, uh, we wanted to, to live that, that, uh, uh, that, that objective. Uh, as part of our part of our design, and so one of the things we did was we had a theme of science and technology. A lot of the grants supported those programs or the establishment of those programs, and that included training teachers, hiring teachers, equipment, partnerships, planning time. We used the grant funding to accomplish what we had envisioned. Some of these these grants can really open up the world to students, and I would like to I would like to say one thing is that. You know, as an educator, when when you put tools in students' hands and with the proper guidance, they they can do amazing things that you can't even imagine. And uh, you know, I think it's you know it's definitely a little bit of work. It, it takes some work, some extra time, uh, but the but the payoff and the dividends of that extra work for the student success is unsurmountable. Do you want to talk a little bit about? your philosophy on on how to sort of stretch the dollars when you do win grants and, and when the grants are successful? What, what What's one of the things that you've done to uh, be fiscally responsible and and also benefit other schools? Well, one of the things we did is we, uh, to have a master plan. And then we tried to get grants that fit into the master plan and would fill the, the voids that we, uh, that we needed to fill, you know, being a technology school, there was a lot of interest in establishing technology. A lot of the programs that started at Clark were then transported to other schools in the district. We hosted a lot of visitors from, from all over the state and they would come and see how we would do things. So there's a lot of, there's, there's a, a high tech high school in Ventura that, that almost looks identical identical to Clark, I look at their materials, and I haven't seen them in several years, but a lot of the stuff that they saw at Clark, they took back to their district and replicated it. That's, that's great. Now, now, we've had success winning grants. You wanna, do you wanna share with the folks you know, what that process is like? Like, where, where do you start? What's, what's step one, and how do you move through it in order to, uh, to receive the funding to secure the well, grant? The first thing is, is to find the need and to find how this fills your, your planning, how your, it fills your strategic plan. And then it's a, a matter of taking that, that need and finding where the funds exist. Um, there's a lot of programs like Perkins. And so we would take those, we would take those needs and, uh, and find uh, places to, to fill the need from, from private, from public funding from state funding and federal funding. Once we got that matched, then we would take and, and uh, lay our vision into the into those needs. There's various grants out there like Perkins and CTAG. And, um, you know, one of the big ones that, that we won was the uh, Career Pathways Trust Grant, which, you know, served the community colleges, local high schools, and reached all the way down to the middle schools. Yeah, it was about a $6 million uh, piece. Well, when we got the Career Pathways grant, we, uh, first of all, we had to find partners within the business community, within the education community. And that was one of the requirements of the grant. When we were developing and, and designing the scope of the projects uh, where our industry partners would come into play, I, you know, we would consult with, hmm. say, Disney or, or whoever. We'd look at what their setups are and and then we were able to actually consult with with Kiko to say hey this is our vision for this program uh what what's the scope look like where where can we go with this and we'd work out the budget and uh they were always really good with uh with with helping us out well CSUN was another one of our partners in the initial grant yeah um, you know Glendale Community College and, and CSUN 
because that was one of the requirements of the grant. And obviously you're writing to the requirements of the grant. And out of that came, uh, came a film festival that's, that's still running to this day um, and has become quite a successful uh, component to, you know, the, the seniors capstone projects and projects and things like that. Now, well, that was a, that was a local state senator's vision. And we were able, he came to us and we were able to, you know, to leverage those, the funds and the training and the collaboration and the partnerships. You know, um, talking about these grants, it reminds me of the time where I was involved with, uh, with David Black and the, the uh, specialized secondary programs. And that was a grant where we went through several rounds. Um, do you want to share with uh, the audience what that's like and, and how those, those work out? And like, when you have a grant that has various rounds, how do you navigate that? Well, you, the, the interesting thing was, is it was a, uh, it was a case of where, where the, the initial grant that got the equipment to give you the capacity to do it was then used to produce. And I think what you did is training videos on, on uh, CAD and CAM machinery that was used throughout the state. You know, as a manager, you gotta be strategic about where your stuff goes and you wanna get the, the biggest bang for your buck. It's kind of ingenious where, you know, we leverage one grant to pay for the gear that then supported another grant, which paid for instruction, which then uh, opened up continual rounds. I think we went through three rounds of that. Professional, so, professional development, uh, all that kind of stuff. And, and meanwhile, the stuff that was originally, you know, part of the first grant yeah. delivered content that affected teachers statewide. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the ca cascade, your, your cascade philosophy and how that, how that worked? <clears throat> well, what we found is we were getting a lot of gear. We would buy it for a certain application and then the application would outstrip the capacity of the equipment. And so you had equipment that, was, that would be not capable of doing video editing, but it would be capable of doing uh, in animation or word processing or digital photography. And so we would move that, we move those computers and that equipment down the line. We, we touched base with this a little bit before, but we're gonna end with success in mind. And what do you think made the school and the grant proposals so successful? If you were to pin it up to two or three things, what, what in your mind really made them successful? We would read the, uh, First of all, we'd read the, the, the request for proposal. We would, we would understand that. And then we would find a need that filled those needs. Or fi we'd find a need at our school that would fill those requirements. In a nutshell, huh? That's all there is to it. And then, of course, being strategic about what you need and, and looking for ways that that money can fill the gaps. I think grant funding is, is a great thing because because it, it's needs-based. Man, it kind of becomes like a snowball effect in a way. You know, when we bought that TriCaster, that first TriCaster, I mean, we had no idea all the things that it would be doing for us. We were doing Skype interviews with people like H.R. McMasters and Alexei Khrushchev and uh, Michael Dukakis, to, to name a couple. And that was through the geopolitics club. And, and it was what a great experience for kids to do it. Plus it benefited the community. We had no idea that it was going to reach to that. We did, uh, we did, we did candidate uh, forums for the, for the school board members. We would, we would take them. And, and so students, uh, st uh, students and, and community members had the opportunity to see what the candidates stood for. And, and it was, it was all very professionally done and delivered over the uh, over the web. I, I, there's got to be a, another hundred examples of where you've used that stuff. Yeah, and then uh, you know there was there was funding. We we were able to get some GoPros. We got the underwater camera. We had the video ray. We were able to go out and document mm -hmm. Dominic's work that she was able to then use as evidence for her grants and grant funding. I mean, it's just once, once you get that ball rolling, meeting all, you're checking all the boxes on the standards, you're, you're getting the students, the outcomes are there. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. Doug, thank you for joining us. And for those of you watching online, why don't you go get some grants?
All right, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome Jonathan Amayo to the fray. Uh, Jonathan, we've talked a lot about grant funding in relation to purchasing media technology. We know as your role here at Keycode as the chief education officer, you're a lot more focused on curriculum. How do grants impact curriculum and the reverse? How do curriculum, how does curriculum impact grants? Well, I spent 20 years writing for different vendors and companies and uh, five years working for Avid doing their courseware development. So when we started to get into scholastic style curriculum and actually had to go and meet those CTE standards or, uh, you know, be compliant for Perkin funding, it was night and day type of development because it wasn't just writing the information. You had to go back and set up quizzes, assessments, you had to set up so the students had metrics. We actually got to the point where we actually needed to hire a person who had tons of practice doing these kinds of setups and bring them in to help us as a department get ready for that. Matt Stroop, who's on the call here, he can talk a little bit more about the changes we had to make to all of our curriculum in order to implement them into our LMS. Um, I also want to mention, at the same time, even if you're not using CTE funding, there are state level grants that we as a vocational school apply for. In California, we use ETP, but every state has funding for students who have disabilities or I was military a long time ago and coming out of the military, there's tons of different programs. And so there are grants for individuals and schools outside of the CTE world. And I highly encourage people to, to investigate for their own state and the region that they're located in. But Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about the challenges of converting our post-production curriculum into uh, a CTE compliant curriculum? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jonathan. So, um, so a lot of this is, is uh, just kind of taking a look at, you know, the, the professional training versus academic training. And, and really what it comes down to is making sure that uh, you're, you're dotting your lowercase j's and crossing your t's uh, in terms of making sure that your curriculum is aligned with various standards that um, help to maintain compliance, as, as well as things like accessibility and, and there's some other items that are involved in there. Um, but at, at the same time, uh, what we do is we take a look at what some of the grants are out there, what some of those requirements are, and then design curriculum that is going to uh, sort of meet the needs of, of what those grants are. But in terms of the courseware and the course design, what we try to do is just make sure that pedagogically they're sound and that they're gonna be in alignment uh, primarily with, with uh, common core standards, which will then trickle into state standards uh, according to what, what the state CTE standards are. Very cool. And any other thoughts on this from everyone else? You know, a lot of times you got to realize that the, uh, the grants, especially ones that come from the state, are looking to fill political needs or um, goals. And so you have to kind of read between the lines and, uh, and, uh, and deliver those because those will be evaluated points. Makes sense. From an actual what, what, development standpoint, I can tell you it takes a lot more time. When we brought Matt on and I was reworking our courseware, and I've been one of the primary developers at Key Code Education, uh, I thought he was joking where he said it was going to be nine months because I can write a book in two or three months for a vendor or a different company on a subject or a workflow. But he wasn't kidding the type of detail you have to get into. And it changed my development time from like three months to nine months to a year. And we're still developing some of the books I wrote over a year ago because they need different standards put into them that I didn't realize that we have to go back and re literally it's like writing four chapters for every one chapter you actually write um, and the amount of detail you have to the, gets put into the book. Sorry. Makes sense. And um, what? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Jeff. No, no, go ahead. I was, I was going to say that, you know, in that development, uh, one of the things that we, we set out to do before we get started is we'll create kind of a blueprint for the course, which will cover some of the course level objectives and then the module level objectives, which will then align with the assessments and all those work in harmony with uh, the standards, which makes a good solid curriculum that can then be implemented. And, um, you know, and, and the whole thing is, 
everything is designed to be an advocate of the student to make sure that they're learning what they need. So when it comes down to moving on to college or career, they're really prepped for it. And one of the things I'll add, Jeff, and to everybody is from an um, audio and music perspective, the national standards from the National Association for Music Education are very well uh, adopted and integrated in state level standards. So that's one thing to consider. Another thing to consider is with a number of the pathways to music and audio careers in which I work, um, the advisory boards for the pathways in particular programs are um, rife with really great professional talent that help to extend those standards into community college level and then to, to career pathways. So things to think about from that. Sounds good. Now, a quick question that I can answer. Uh, Brandon has actually asked where the uh, white paper is. Um, if you're on the key code watch page, it's down below. So just scroll on down, you'll find it there. Um, let's let's move on. Uh, Lee, uh, what are the top one or two types of creative media CTE programs for which you've you know seen a successful funds acquisition and deployment happen? I'll give you a couple of examples, Jeff, and thank you. Um, I'll go with two at the high school level. There's a wonderful program, and there's a case study at pro.focusright.com um, on a program at the Fort Hayes Metropolitan Education Center in Columbus, Ohio, that covers everything from uh, digital audio, uh, media, music, um, video as well. Um, courseware is fantastic, and over the years, um, Milton Ruffin and Ryan Dan Bibber, who run that program, have done a wonderful job at securing funds. Another that I'll mention to you is a, a program in uh, the Centinella Valley Schools near the Corporate Office for Focus Rank Group US, which is uh, in, in LA, in the LA metro area. And that Career Pathways Program for Professional Music has done a fantastic job of securing funds as well. So there's a two, those are two examples, and we have case studies available to the viewers uh, who would like to read about those programs. Awesome. Um, any other, anyone else seen any programs that have gone from, from an idea to uh, fruition? Yeah. Um, uh, when, when I was working at, at Clark Magnet during my tenure under, under Doug, uh, we had we had a lot of success with our multimedia programs in general. So uh, when I say that, that'll include our animation courses, the uh, video production, and uh, photography, digital photography, because a lot of the the grants that we we're working on had that digital and technology component to it that sort of opened up a lot of opportunity. And uh, and Doug, you could probably even talk about how the media grants and, and things that we were winning sort of filtered into some of the other curriculum as well. Well, that's correct. We, we tried to uh, put together grants that would be scalable and that would be, you know, the, the, the work would be transferable. We never, you know, we didn't want to start, we wanted something that was based on prior success that we could justify and it made the evaluation of the grant much easier to do. Uh, a lot of the a lot of that stuff, um, it was kind of a natural feed because we were all dealing with the same kind of hardware, same kind of software, and we were able to kind of move those things around. And it, uh, it's, it was much more strategic in the way we put it together. And, and the awesome. interesting thing about that is uh, when we would secure one grant, we could then create capacity that would actually uh, align ourselves for future grants and we were able to use previous grant successes to then filter into uh, future grant successes. Yeah, it was much easier to reference what you were doing and what your capabilities are. And then, and then you get a reputation for being successful because the people that are evaluating these grants um, tend to cross over into various other things. The other thing that's good is to have your partners set up. So the, the community college, the university, folks that you've worked for in the past, they would call us and say, hey, we've got this grant, we need a, we need a high school piece. Would you be interested in? And so that kind of collaboration really led to a lot of successes 
uh, over the years. So talking about success, so are the skills that the programs you mentioned, training students, are they, are they getting young people into college or right into jobs? And this, we may have to end up talking about our TD for today as well on this. Well, I would say both. I mean, <laughs> you have some examples, Matt, from your students. Yeah, I was going to, if, if you want to talk, Doug, you can go ahead or if you want to. No, 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 go ahead, Matt. Yeah, so. Uh, so yes, as Doug said, uh, uh, both, you know, um, and he just previously touched base on this as well, where we, um, as I came on board, Doug was very, very quick to get me connected to the community colleges. So I was, I was coming out of industry, moving into education and, and navigating that difference, which was, you know, interesting. Um, but you know, in, in, in our conversations, the goal was, look, you know, Doug was a, a previous uh, vocational education teacher. I worked in the industry. The idea was, okay, uh, we're going to hang our hats on teaching students skills that are going to get them paid, right? So, so what are we going to focus on? What are our objectives? But then at the same time, well, what are the needs of the colleges? And uh, we, we articulated with Glendale, who was articulated with um, CSUN, correct me if I'm wrong, Doug. Correct. And, and so we, we made those articulations and much like Lee was saying, those, that curriculum then stretched from the middle schools up to, you know, 13, 14, a junior college. And uh, what that did, did was it help, uh, helped us to create uh, a pathway to college, but then at the same time, the skill sets led to internships. So we had seniors um, going to internships with companies that were local partners and uh, key code happened to be one of those and and I believe uh, our technical director is sitting on the other end of this uh, this webinar doing a fantastic job and I could not be more proud of it. It's always good when we can talk about key codes Chase Baker. You know you find you find that a lot of these relationships are viral too. Um, we, I, I was the CTE director at one point in doing both jobs and, uh, we needed to, we needed an automotive program. Lindell College referred us to Rio Hondo College. One led to the next. Yeah. And, and that's not just in, in the media programs that, you know, that, that worked into our robotics program. And there was a lot of cross pollinating that once grants were received, uh, it, it created these really interesting situations where I would be working with an engineering teacher and documenting their work. And then they would use that video as sort of a marketing tool to win other grants. And, you know, then we got into specialized secondary education grants. Next thing I knew, I was producing uh, instructional training on pause milling machines with the engineering teacher, but a partnership with JTL where students were interning. So it, it creates this really interesting synergy between the community, the school, the students, and, and how the students collaborate and cross pollinate, I guess you could say. Yeah, and the, the other thing was, is that because that went on a, on a statewide platform, there were schools that I'd never heard of calling and saying, how did you get your, your partnerships with Oz? How did you do that? Can we get more of this information? And we were able to, to see where holes were in, in the product that we were producing for the State Department of Education. And I've got, oh, up. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, Jeff, I got two quick examples. One, I mentioned uh, Lawndale High School in the Centinella Valley Unified School District before. California State requires an advisory board or council for pathways programs, and the El Camino Community College is represented on the pathway advisory council for that school's program in commercial music. And there's a baked in opportunity there for pathway into community college and also for lots of internships. Another that just struck me in Essex County, New Jersey. So that's Newark. There's the Donald M. Payne Senior High School 
Mark Beckett um, does a fantastic job. He's been in the district for 20 years. A couple of things. He runs a nonprofit in the community where students go and work and have opportunity to internship. He provides pathways to internships in studios in the New York metro area. Um, and third, super interesting with his program, um, many students had traditionally not necessarily had the confidence to consider college careers. And we at Focusrite um, Group in Education have been able to develop a relationship with one of our higher ed partners in Full Sail University in Florida. And for the first time in the past year, there's been a pathway created where students are aware of um, college um, training and career training and actually have access to scholarship dollars there. Super cool. Great program to check out. That, that makes we also sense, get a, oh, I was going to say we get a lot of high school, well, not a lot, but we get a small percentage of high school students through our vocational school. And, and for us, it's it's not as many as I would I would expect because a lot of them don't understand how little information they need to enter the film industry, meaning if they're going into a particular job, they really need to just focus on that job and those set of tools and that software to get in. And then, of course, have the soft skills, the professionalism, which we cover in some of our classes. But most kids go off and get a year degree in film production, so on and so forth, in order to become an assistant editor. And so we don't see as many kids directly from high school as I would have expected to, but we do like, I would say five to 10% of our, our, our classes in Los Angeles are kids coming out of high school who have done or one year of junior college, community college and realize they don't need that. They can just move directly into, I actually had a student from UNLV who dropped out after the first year, took an AVID class, an AVID assistant editing class, and they've been working now for a, you know six months. Um, and so uh, it, it it's not a large percentage, but there's that, you know, that cross of students who are going into technical careers that require vocational training versus a full four-year degree. Um, and, you know, we're starting to get the, the kids who fall in the cracks. And Jonathan, I, I totally agree with you. And I think one of the things that people don't realize is that the, the skill set of being on time, being a, you know, being a good collaborator, being a good colleague, you know, those kind of things can come very, very early. And, and no matter where you're going to work, you're going to need those skills. It's funny you mentioned that, Doug, because that it, 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 when we started developing our curriculum for you know, uh, and started to pitch it to different schools, and and we actually have a pilot program going on now. The thing that really sold them on it was the amount of soft skills we build into the class, because knowing AVID or knowing how to be an assistant editor is one thing, but knowing how to be a team player and what that actually means that you are not going to be a superstar. You're going to be there learning and absorbing information so that one day you can move. That Those sets of skills, it's hard to teach. And I ran another school you know, 10 years ago and we had an internship program. And having kids who show up on time, who don't search Facebook or Instagram was just coming out at the time, but who take, we literally worked in a school and I could only still get 5% of the students or the interns not to spend their time on Facebook when we had classes running all the time that they could audit anytime they liked. Um, and so those set of soft skills are something that I, as a manager, have always looked for. And, you know, I would say, you know, the our enrollment manager was a former intern of mine 15 years ago. Um, and, and so it, it it's they're critical and they're, you know, it's one of those things that can help differentiate your curriculum from my perspective is having that built into your class, having talking about not just the technology, but how are you going to convey this to your higher ups? You can't be condescending. You can't be annoying. You have to explain that there may be a problem, but you also still have to be part of the team. And who do you talk to and, and where is your line before you cross it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it's it's especially the kids who are leaving, you know, I always look at college, not just as a, a four-year degree, but it's a social experiment that your first time away from home, you're learning how to have relationships with other people, have heart rate breakups, how to manage a credit card, a lot of kids for the first time, right? And, and those set of soft skills, if you miss four years of community or of college and you go to these direct um, focused schools that are vocational based, how do you learn how to show up on time? <laughs> and I was in the military uh, directly out of high school. And I always learned showing up on time, respect rank, not the person, and volunteer, don't be told. These were like the first set of things I remember learning in the first year. And they became critical to my success when I got out of the military, I realized. Because most 
people my age hadn't learned it in their 20s. Um, and so yeah, I don't want to make this whole conversation about those, but it, it is though they're critical parts, I think, of you know, today's new curriculum that are going out in the, you know, when we compare ourselves to other companies who are developing courseware, that's something I notice has become a standard is adding that extra information into the, the class, the course, the you know, program. We, we had a situation one time. Excuse me. Go ahead. We had a situation one time where we had a student, or we've had several students like this that, that are, were very talented and skilled. He was an animator. He ended up, he would come in as a junior, do his academic classes in the in the during the morning, and then he would, you know, take his briefcase and go down and work at Arperian Studios, um, cool. doing the I forget it was the family. But it was one of the one of the early Disney shows. Ma, uh, I forget what it was called, but but here that this kid was actually working in a, pro a professional environment, but he's also going to school. He's also, you know, every project he did was an animation themed. Uh, did a did a animation on the Great Gatsby. He hated the Great Gatsby, but he loved to animate. I actually just watched the film for the first time, but some it's amazing. And I don't know how, you know, I've gone through, you know, at that other school, I had maybe 200 interns over the course of four years. And I would say I could count the number of superstars who somehow innately knew these skills at a young age, you know, and I'm talking 17, 18 year olds. And the rest, it was something that you would have to sit down and talk to them about how, you know, how to even get along with their peers, not their managers or people who are in a professional position, but other interns. Um, and it, it was amazing to me that a lot of kids didn't learn this in high school or or they're at home. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I teach, a, not to go off subject, but I teach an engineering class. So I teach a bunch of them for high-end post-production engineers. And I joke with them at the end of the class, the last day when we're doing the review before the exams, that the last subject we're going to cover troubleshooting, but we're actually going to talk about people skills, troubleshooting the person, because in the end of the day, uh, you, you know how a broken piece of gear is going to be solved. It's going to get fixed. I've never worked on a project where it never, it doesn't get fixed, but the person and how to work with that person may not. And, and so we spend time on the oldest self-help book in the world. I think in America, at least it's how to win friends and influence people. Um, and I, we try to give that to a lot of our professional based classes like assistant editing and uh, post coordinator job oriented classes that are really popular at key code education. We try to hand them these books or, or at least make them aware of these types of skills that you need to develop in Hollywood. I would say they're just as important as your ability to edit or your ability to shoot on a camera. Your ability to get along with somebody is almost more important in some ways. And the, the really fun thing is, you know, we find those people who aren't going to be on Facebook and then we set them up as interns in the marketing department and have them handle the social media stuff. Uh, we got a question that came in for Mark Beckett. Uh, he said, thank you, Dr. Lee. Question, is there a step-by-step -step manual to help move more grants through my music production program? And he said, Dr. Lee, I, I, it was me. <laughs> hey, Mark, it's good to hear from you. I'm glad you're with us today. How fantastic. Um, uh, step by step, there are lots of resources and thing I'll call out and it's available to everybody here. Uh, I, I was very um, proud to work with an expert independent writer last year in the Focus Right Group and Education Expert Guide on how to find career and technical education funding. Um, the skills and the content there applies to all discipline areas. There is a specific area on music and audio funding and um, there are three specific areas in there about, you know, how to develop your grant resources, links out to, and um, we heard this, I think, from Doug earlier and Matt, state-specific requirements for Perkins funding, and then also we've got links in there to state res resources and complementary resources for your program, like the one that Mark has. So I'd say start there, and uh, Mark's got my number, so he knows he can always give a call and we can talk about it. If you had the conference call bingo, if you're, bingo, if you're muted, it was me. Um, so that, that kind of touches into the next question there, Lee. Uh, some examples of how grants have been used for audio projects and what kind of build outs and equipment end up being the most common for that. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, a couple of examples I'm thinking of community college programs. Uh, one of the things that we've worked on over the last year, year and a half, um, are audio over IP, um, you know, automated Dante networking, and I, I'll throw into this, uh, Jeff, into the panel, complementary certifications that can be baked into your curriculum and certifications that students can take with them from your program right into a job out of, say, high school or from community college or that will help them at the college level. But at several campuses, we've worked on um, significant, like, high-quality, multi-channel audio, low latency, what that means to sort of get away from your copper infrastructure. Um, that audio over IP Dante networking technology um, comes with standards-based courses, which um, students and professionals can take. Uh, there's a focus right education, uh, focus right pro flavor of that in our RedNet certification courses. But where we're finding investments recently are um, audio networking, um, production skills, what that means in the studio, what that means in multi-room facilities and uh, moving high quality audio around. Um, there's a lot of energy around this right now and a lot of opportunity for thing. Another thing that I'll mention, and we talked about this um, in our prep a little bit before coming on the panel today. Um, if you haven't checked it out, everybody, there's a really great, go to um, cte.ed.gov. There's a, a, a program on the 22nd sponsored by um, the Department of Education on Advancing Equity and Career um, Connected um, Education Summit. It's uh, talking about the opportunity to support funding with in programs for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the disciplines, the technical and business disciplines that we work in. Go register for that. I did. I think it'll give you some ideas that'll directly to support that question. That's on February 22nd. Lee, do you find a, into the chat? Lee, do you find that manufacturers tend to sponsor grants or uh, um, funding for schools and and other institutions? So, um, do manufacturers sponsor? What we? I'll give you an example for what we do at Focus Right Group. We provide um, support for education discounts. Uh, and we make that readily, readily available for partners like KeyCode. Uh, do we make specific grants? No. Do we often get involved in collaborative programs around developing curriculum and content and best practices and are there opportunities there? Yes. And that, that goes into the, the old story I always tell about there was a company that used to give out really inexpensive computer gear to high schools and colleges and when you know they got they got into some tough times and and you know they, they continued that program and then the people who had grown up with these machines got into purchasing roles and started buying apple computers um, apple exists in my opinion because of the investments they made at the education level years and years ago it took a long time to pay off but boy did it apple 2e we had a hundred of them yep <laughs> Yeah, and, and Lee, I'd like to touch base with something else that, that you had mentioned, uh, it touched base on it, but it's the advisory boards, you know, uh, reaching out to, to local companies or manufacturers or whoever to be a part of the advisory boards, because then when situations do come up, like with, a, you know, uh, the Career Pathways Trust Grant, where we needed to have uh, community partnership, it was obvious that the key code was going to be that that community partner and um you know that that was a substantial grant that that also helped to uh to fund internships um through that grant you know we, we established a film festival which was sort of a partnership with a local uh, uh politician and uh, doug correct me if i'm wrong here because I'm, I'm trying to I'm pulling some Fuzz in. Hey, you're 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 breaking the ice with me too. Yeah. Um, so the and then that that also supported our articulation with CSUN and and uh, led to probably I, I want to say maybe between the community partnerships with Glendale and Burbank and and everything that we were doing, I I, I would say and don't quote me on this but approximately 30 internships and some of those led to full-time positions I mean, it was a six million dollar grant i mean it was they they had a, a, a 15 million dollar um 
you know, threshold and then they had a six and then a smaller one. For us, where we were in scale, six million dollars was was perfect. Yeah. Because you know, it, it's tough to spend six million dollars. I mean, don't tell that to key code, but uh it it uh you, you really and it and, and it deliver it right, you know. Yeah, and and there was a lot of great support there from key code in terms yeah. of you know working with our internships and working with uh the the educators, making sure that um we were moving in the right direction like lee was talking about you know audio over ip well it was for for media it was how do we move this stuff around on a network have network computers where we could then increase the amount of work hours per period by divvying up okay this editor can work on that scene and this one on that scene instead of bottlenecking where it was one person one machine it could be one editor per one scene and then a, a student director could go around and work with the editors to realize the vision. Um, and that also led into funding to build a sound room where we had our consultants we could bring in, uh, the former uh, composer from that 70s show, uh, Brett Perry, came in and worked with our students to help the musically inclined students create compositions for student films. So we, we took all of this stuff, which then were showcased at the, at the film festival and then there we invited all of our industry partners and new partners so they could see all the students work uh, and a lot of that stemmed from you know investments made with perkins funding where it paid for the teachers um, and to to become professionally certified so so at clark they supported me to become certified so we could set up an apple authorized training center and an avid learning partner and and all of that stuff so it's this is the snowball effect, I guess, is what I'm getting. You know, Doug, and you asked about grants, and I'm sitting here thinking I've got a really good example with some schools that I mentioned already in this conversation. So one of the things that I had the honor of doing over the past year is I worked on a program. Um, one of the brands that um, Focusrite owns is a company called Vivation, which creates uh, manufactured media controllers that work with hardware, with other hardware and software, work with Ableton Live. We've got a, a Amplify Studio is a freely downloadable DAW that goes with that. And I, we, Mr. Beckett was just on from Newark. We were able to provide a grant of um, Novation launch pads, which are grid controllers that are used for music creation and for triggering sounds and grooves. You can record with them. They also are easily mapped to control studio gear and lighting and other, um, other equipment and we were able to make a grant to Donald uh, M. Payne Senior High School in Newark and with Mark Beckett who was asked the question before with his nonprofit in the community we were able to share uh, gear there another interesting thing I mentioned Lawndale High School in Centinella Valley we were able to make a grant of launch pads to complement um, student kits so during the pandemic when students couldn't be in school we were able to provide gear students were able to take those kits home included an audio interface a focus right scarlet included the launch pad and students would go home and do creation take those home. Um, there's a CTE program at Roosevelt High School in St. Louis where the launch pads were primarily, the Novation launch pads were primarily used for remote control of all the gear and lighting in studios. The productions, um, video, audio, and podcasts that were happening in that high school program on a regular basis, we were able to support additional gear to go home, but the district didn't necessarily have um, resources to buy gear on the flash, on the spot for the pandemic, and it enabled the expansion of the program into homes during the critical time when we were all sort of, I don't know if we can say we're used to it now, but when we were getting used to what's the blended learning going to be like and to support an audio and video CTE program in St. Louis that kept kids doing what they needed to do and, and limited downtime and allowed them to do some coding software and acquire some new skills that they can take on for jobs as well. And yeah, we had a good relationship with, uh, with uh, Haas Manufacturing that that makes NC meals and those kind of things. They're very, very supportive of our programs. Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, FIRST Robotics. These are competitions, but they're all, you know, it opens the door for other possibilities. Very cool. So last question, uh, Edgar Reeb said uh, asks love the idea of grant dollars to grow student media support in a time of shrinking budgets 
Where do you see the greatest growth areas for students looking to go into media? I manage Seattle Public Schools Peg Station and want to support solid pathways. Anybody can jump in on that. Well, I would I would start off by by introducing the you know the the person that's interested to the schools to the programs, uh, using them as maybe a, an opportunity to take a field trip to their facility and and uh, you know getting your name out there and 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 it works for both the vendor and the and the school. I can, I'll jump in. I'll tell you one thing that's uh, uh, always in the conversation when we're talking with colleges and with community colleges and career training programs right now. There's an incredible demand in the market. We talked about audio over IP, Dante and RedNet, and think about immersive audio too. You know, everyone who's taking a, a, a post and mastered product for audio and audio and video today has to think about what that, not just um, surround sound or Dolby 5.1, but what that immersive audio um, product needs to be. And so focusing on investment in immersive audio skills for your students, whether it's audio for video or audio standing on its own. And um, there are certification programs and skills trainings from, you know, from Dolby, from my company, from KeyCode that help support this. You know, whether it's Netflix or Sony Latin America or you name it, I'm just picking a few customers that we have off the top of my head that I've spoken with recently. Those skills are in really high demand and I would think really strongly about investing in that, looking for dollars to support that. There's money out there. Um, that's a place to go. Um, and, and, and those those conversations come out kind of organically as you're showing around, as you're talking, hey, what, have you ever thought of this? What do you need? Uh, it, it, it's, uh, Matt, we've had a, you know, we probably had a hundred opportunities to, to connect with people and uh, our, our friend from uh, ESPN that we were we were shooting a uh, we were shooting a Christmas parade and he says you got a you got a uh, we got a TriCaster in the truck you got a TriCaster we just got four of those I think you're on mute Matt yeah I, I was just kind of calling okay, sorry. my wife is over here working and I was like okay you know, <laughs> you know she was like yeah we were we were out there with the kids and you know. Uh, and and one one other thing, you know, with this question, the thing that I like that they that they threw out there was the word media, because I think a lot of times uh, programs, video production programs, get get a little too fixated on industry. When you take a step back, especially now, more than ever, every corporation, every college has a media production team program and. And I'm not talking little ones, I'm talking massive, right? So I, so I live in central Pennsylvania, Penn State University is right down the road. They probably employ, my guess is about 200 plus media specialists that range anywhere from graphic designers to producer, producer editors. So if you have really sound, I mean, they, you don't have to be the most perfect, but if you have sound skills and you can manage a production, and like Jonathan was mentioning, if you have those soft skills, you can work with people. There's jobs that you can be making fifty to hundred thousand dollars a year producing media content for a university, or for a local uh, television station, or corporations. I mean, there's or I mean, the industry is decentralized now with cloud computing. Most of I work for another company where we manage productions and most of our all of my productions are remote. Nobody's in the office anymore. Um, and so there is a lot more opportunity all over the country, not just in Los Angeles. And 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 as Matt said, you know, when I came out of the military, my first job wasn't for a production. It was Bose mm -hmm. who wanted me to run their production center. And, and I went on to move work for Avid. But my point being is that was located in an area that I lived in northern Massachusetts. And, and so it was convenient without me having to leave all my friends and move west that early. I was also going to mention gaming is, you know, I might be surrounded by kids and my stepkids and um, a couple of the local high schools. But by far and away, a lot, most of the kids want to get into production and production with gaming. Um, and so I, I see a, maybe it's because it's their hobby or whatever, but, it, you know, I'm reading about Activision just being bought for $70 billion and 
there is a lot of money in the gaming industry right now. I feel like it's hotter than Hollywood. Um, and it, it's it's as wild west as the internet right now, especially as they migrate from console based games to cloud based games. And it used to be independent studios and now they're all being bought by conglomerate. It's just the wild west. And so anyways. And, and, uh, and a ton of money there. I mean, hundreds of Twitch feeds coming in. To, oh, uh, yeah. To, and it's a, it's and and it's still storytelling. You know what? I sometimes I get stuck with people who are. You know, a game's not a movie or a film or a narrative. And I'm like, you know, I call BS on it. It's complete. It's a, a different form of storytelling uh, that kids can get immersed. I think it's a more immersive version of storytelling, especially these games like that allow you to play in a world like Spider-Man. I was just playing that with the kids the other day. And you don't have to do the mission. You could just go around saving people and hang out in New York City. And, and that is a different type of story, a nonlinear type of storytelling that a lot of us aren't used to. Um, and it's exciting, you know, and so um, as Hollywood is consolidated to the streaming networks, there are there are new areas to explore that are still just a different, you know, a different type of camera, a different type of pen to write the story. And, and I would say one, one other thing is uh, pre-production. So you look at companies like Third Floor, I believe they, they started up their third or fourth production house. They got one in Atlanta, one in LA, I think one in New York, but but at any rate, what they specialize in is, is pre-production. So, you know, Marvel, Disney, whoever, they, they're like, hey, we need a pre-production pass. So your storyboard artists, some editors, uh, traditional artists, there's, there's a lot of pre-production for, for animation, filmmaking, television, all that stuff. And they'll even get into commercial pre-production. So uh, as, as much as, Netflix is pumping out new shows. They need storyboard artists and, and people who can sort of lay the blueprint for the visual story aspect of production as well. So, um, yeah, the, the mar market is wide open. I mean, it's, it's, I love that you, there was just mentioned about the uh, field trips. I mean, I remember my first production studio that I saw, Sears Roebuck Company, downtown Chicago, Sears Tower. Uh, as a sophomore in, in high school, uh, Mr. Lenny made, made, made the trip for us. Uh, we've run out of time. Uh, great, exciting topic. Um, if there's more questions, please pop them down into the chats. We'll reach out to, the, to our panelists and get those answered. Uh, we also mentioned that the, um, the panel that Lee talked about, we will put the link to that below. And we'd like to thank everybody for coming to join us today. Um, you know, Key Code supports many of these uh, education institutions. And we, we also need to have a chat, uh, Lee, about the folks in, in Newark and, and possibly getting some interns in New York City. Uh, but thanks again to our panelists for joining us today. Thanks for our audience for coming on. Um, and thanks for everybody who's watching this a little later than today. <laughs> have a great rest of your day. Thanks for watching well Broadcast to Post. Please make Thank sure you. to subscribe Thank to the you. podcast Thank you, everyone. to receive future episodes. Follow Key Code Media on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram to receive news on additional AV, broadcast, and post-production technology content. See you next time, folks.